Hi, this is Bob Wells here, and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. This is the show where we hear about people's interests and uncover some fascinating stories at the same time. I hope you enjoy today's show. In today's show, I'm joined by Rafe Baldwin. Rafe is a versatile designer, sculptor, teacher, and author. He works in several media, producing garden objects and sculpture, as well as decorative pieces and furniture for the home. His art is consistently playful and inventive, producing such things as weather vanes, fountains, wall mirrors, bird tables, chairs, cupboards, ceramics, and opulently painted screens that often have a surreal left-of-field character. The functional nature of much of his open-air work gives it a natural kinetic quality, work that's very much about movement and animation, as well as the rich interplay of different components, colours and materials resourcefully combined. He has authored several books. The Blue Book is the first book in the Adventures of the Blue Giraffe illustrated series written for ADHD and ASD children and parents. Hello and welcome to the show, Rafe. Hello, Bob. Great to hear from you. Well, yes, this is, uh, this is a, a great pleasure, um, being able to talk about my life. Um, when you describe it like that, I think, gosh, <laughs> have I really done all that stuff? It's, um, it's fantastic, isn't it? I mean, I, you know, we, we've had, I mean, the last time we met, I think, was, was when we were leaving school. And we're talking about, about 1978, aren't we, Rafe? Yes, in 1978, I left and went up to Coventry Polytechnic, which was known as Lanchester Polytechnic in those days. And my design career started around, uh, it was, if I remember rightly, it was called Alternative Transportation and Design. Yeah. And uh, I started, and the, one of the very first projects we did was to protect an egg from a falling brick. And we had that, to... That sounds interesting. Well, it's a, it was a case of using paper only, yeah. uh, a sh- couple of sheets of paper, how to protect a an egg from being crushed and um, there was a lot of mess as you can imagine but eventually we sussed out that it had to be a corrugated double skin tube and if it was the right height I think it was about sort of four and a half inches the brick would crush it but not break the egg Uh, so that was an interesting intro into my design career but um, after a period of time I realized that automotive design wasn't just for me yeah i wanted to get my hands dirty and make things and so i moved down to kingston polytechnic which is now kingston university uh, and started uh, working on design and related product sorry furniture design and related products Uh, and that was fascinating because uh, it introduced me to the italian ethos of making things and seeing what the market would um uh, accept yeah and uh I, I made all the projects myself, which was a very, very good learning can I, curve. Can I just interrupt a moment? That, that's an interesting yes. concept. So, so making things and then seeing if the market accepts, as, a, as opposed to seeing what the market wants and then making something. That's interesting. Yes, it was a, a very different approach. Uh, in the UK, there tended to be a sort of market research, see if uh, the market was acceptable to this new idea, this product. Yeah. And often people don't know what they want. So a lot of ideas would flounder at that stage. So this this sounds a little bit like the way Steve Jobs worked. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I, I think he, he, he felt that there was a, a market for a, a, a sort of desktop computer, but yeah. they were very much sort of maverick designers and inventors and got very in- involved in the process of creating the object rather than assessing whether there was a big market out there. And it's yeah. the same with the Italians. The the people at the Casino that we met would prototype ideas and have some very interesting ideas and they would put them into the Milan Furniture Fair and see what the response was. And if they had a lot of interest, they would go ahead and manufacture it, which was very different from the way the British tended to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. So I, I had that as my grounding, and I always felt I wanted to work my hand to make things. Uh, so most of my designs were based around my my skill set, which obviously grew over the years as I experimented and had a go, you know, yeah. I think the best way to 
do something and learn is to have a go. It may fail, but you learn from your failure. Yeah, of course you do. And, well. and all the time, I guess, you, you're improving and building up your craft. Yes, yes. And um, I think also having a very inquiring uh, approach to the way you get excited about materials. I think this is something that I I like to have a go. You know, so there's a sheet of copper or a piece of pewter or I'm working with um, found objects at the moment and creating jewellery. Yeah. I get stimulated by the actual material and think, well, how can I use this? How can I utilise this? And what processes are there available to actually connect this to yeah. this piece of material? Well, I noticed that on, and we'll obviously give listeners... Um, the link to to your your website. Um, yes, but I noticed that on a lot of your uh, works of art and, and jewelry and everything, that where you use what I would call natural objects in a lot of instances. Yes, yes. I think it's a. I'm, I'm not sure whether it's commercially brilliant idea because I tend to get very excited about a new material and go ahead and use it and. Uh, and, and so there is a learning curve because obviously for the first few times it doesn't go quite how you expect. Yeah. And then you may have to buy some more equipment and kit to actually fabricate with these materials. Um, but it it is the way I work. I just get very excited about new things and uh, new ideas. And I think that's probably part of being a designer. You know, there's a lot of commercial materials out there and commercial ideas and they feed off each other. So you were talking about when you um, first started and realised that you wanted to sort of work work with your hands. What happened after that? Where, where did you what, what did you do after that, Rafe? Uh, well, when I left Kingston, I worked for a company called One Off, which was using interestingly key clamp scaffolding pipe to create furniture and platform beds. Yeah, um, and they were they were actually very interesting objects very heavy and uh i delivered these beds all around london uh one of them which was to boy george's drummer at the time because we we're oh, talking right. quite a few years back yeah, in the yeah, 80s yeah um and, the, and these were scaffold scaffold pipes basically yes scaffolding yeah. uh with key clamp which is a bit like meccano you could yeah. bolt different lengths of pipe together and create platform beds or standard beds and it was working with ron arad at the time who was famous for his rover seats, which were rover chairs from the rover car uh, with a scaffolding frame. And they were featured on Top Gear with Jeremy Clarkson sitting on one. So that was uh, where I started to experiment in other materials. And my interest in furniture as sculpture developed from that. And then my very first commission was to create a a bird table and... uh, I used copper pipe which uh, for plumbing, which because I was also plumbing kitchens and, you know, doing some uh, house improvement. Oh, jobs. so you were able to use the, you know, the blowtorch yes. skills and things like that. That's right. And so suddenly I could look at uh, the copper pipe and think, actually, this is amazing stuff. I can, uh, I can create furniture with this as well as plumbing a sink. Did you find yourself um, inclined to wanting to sort of do some work underneath somebody's sink, some artistic Shape, maybe. <laughs> no, no. Usually, you want it to be economical and uh, yeah. get in try and get, get out. It. Well, make sure it doesn't leak. Actually, that's the trouble yeah. with plumbing. It's very yeah. easy to get it slightly wrong and uh, end up with a, a bit of a disaster. Water so, always finds a way, doesn't it? It does. It does. And uh, I think it is much easier now because there's sort of push fit systems. But at the time, it was all using a, a torch. Yeah, uh, and solder and putting the pipes together in the right form. So plumbing has improved enormously over the years. Yeah. And so after that? Well, after that, uh, I ended up needing a job. I was married and we had children on the way. So I ended up being a studio manager at Eton College, which was a very interesting uh, job for 12 years yeah uh, helping the boys create things uh, looking after the materials and the studio space um, so that introduced me to another set of skills 
And at the same time, I was always running my own studio workshop in the background and doing commissions. And every year I had one or two big commissions for weather vanes or fountains. Yeah. And that was, you know, the two in a way fed off each other because obviously my experimental approach to materials would help the lads. And when I moved on to teach at Newcastle, my students uh, had quite a broad range of skills which enabled us to get through the various projects that students came up with and often there's an interchange of ideas so while you're teaching you get ideas back and you think oh I could apply that to my own work so it's, it's, a, it's a good way of working and um, I enjoyed it immensely yes. So you mentioned Newcastle that that's Newcastle under Lyme in Shropshire rather than Newcastle, Newcastle on Tyne in England isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah. It's in the centre of the country. Yeah. A lot of people get muddled up and think, gosh, have you gone all the way up to Gateshead or wherever it is? <laughs> and I said, no, no, it's under Lyme. And uh, it was good, yes. It, yeah. uh, I, I worked there for nearly 12 years. And then um, there was a bit of a crisis in the country and a lot of older teachers, because one gets older, were made redundant and there was a change. And that led to me working full-time as a, a designer for myself in my own studio, which has proved to be very good. And, yeah, I've been doing that. And then I had always wanted to do some writing and illustration, yeah. and that evolved around about sort of six, uh, six plus years ago. Um, and I started writing this book about uh, my son, well, um, just just before we talk about that, because mm. I, I've I've read the book and it, and it's absolutely fantastic. It's it's obviously a children's book, but the, but the way it's written and the illustrations are fantastic. Um, what sort of led what led you to create the blue or what what is the first book in the Blue Giraffe Adventures, the, the Blue Bite? What actually led you to create that, Rafe? Well, um, it's a long story. <laughs> We've got time. <laughs> we, uh, you, uh, when my firstborn was uh, 18 months, we knew that there was something slightly amiss. And we're talking 26-odd years ago. Yeah. And I'd never heard the term autism. Obviously, we were new parents. And um, I think it was a bit of a shock. You know, we, would, we, we had expected bringing up a child to be quite hard work. Uh, but we hadn't quite expected it to be such hard work. And back then, I don't think the UK knew much about autism. Certainly we didn't. Uh, there wasn't really an internet to go and search for things. And this was a term which I'd never heard of. Uh, yeah. We were really dealing with just a, a, a scallywag of a child as far as we would so, so just for listeners, yeah. when you say hard work, what what can you give us any examples? Well, the the biggest problem is communication. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, I think a child that has difficulty communicating tends to become more physical in their way they communicate. So we had uh, he went to various schools from Montessori right through to the age of eight. I think there was nine different schools where he'd been excluded because his interaction with the other kids tend to be more physical or his behaviour was disturbed because he got frustrated and full of anxiety. So that was yeah. uh, quite an issue for us as parents and we had parenting courses and I think there was just a general lack of knowledge, unlike now, about the condition. And, yeah. Uh, it has now become known as autistic spectrum disorder, yeah. which is uh, in the term, you know, it's, it's actually a spectrum and it can be very deep autism or it can be very high functioning autism, but it's there. But at the time we didn't know this. We were just dealing with a child who just didn't seem to fit in. It must've been very challenging for you both. It was, I mean, it ultimately led to, you know, split ups and all sorts of things, which, you know, we don't have to go through, but it was a difficult period in our lives. Yeah. And uh, the going back to the question, which was about where the idea came from. Yeah. Uh, I I was I took my son to Chester Zoo, and we were looking at the the big giraffes, and uh, and I'd also years ago called my workshop 
the Blue Giraffe oh, workshop. Right. Yeah. Which actually came off the back of a pack of uh, playing cards produced by the Blue Giraffe Cooperative in China. And I thought, oh, I like that. I'll pinch that. And um, and then I was, as I said, in a Chester Zoo and uh, looking at the giraffes with the lad. And I suddenly had this idea that, you know, I could repurpose the blue giraffe because he would be the odd one out because uh, my son was always the odd one out. And, yeah. and so you have to envisage a blue giraffe looking at the other brown giraffes and uh, they were po- pointing a finger and saying, you know, why are you blue? You're the odd one out. And I thought yeah. this was quite a good way forward and and it just sort of grew in my mind and I, I started thinking you know there's a you know the blue giraffe riding a bicycle which is the first book and uh, there's a, a whole series of events that we've been through as a family yeah. and th- I think it has enormous appeal the yeah, idea yeah. of this uh, wacky um, and were, giraffe. Were the, did you actually so were the stories themselves were, were you actually um, making them up as, as uh, you know were you talking to your son with these stories at the time, when events took place or, or mentioning the Well, bar? no, actually they're based on the events that I had with my son and things that happened. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, it was a learning curve. I mean, one of the problems with uh, a parent is, is you get very close and it's difficult to understand quite what's happening. And, and often with reflection, you look back on an event of the day and think, well, I mishandled that. Because fundamentally, autistic children, as I understand it, suffer an extreme anxiety in any change. So as a parent, you want to introduce your kids to all sorts of new experiences. Um, And then, of course, you realise with hindsight that actually that put the child into a state of anxiety, which led to the behaviour and the issues that happened that day. And at the time, it can be quite difficult. And then again, looking back... It can be quite anecdotal and quite amusing. So I started using that amusement to create this idea of the giraffe on his... The first book is about his bicycle, which you can get on Amazon. Um, It's called The Adventures of the Blue Giraffe. And the first book, The Blue Bike, is how he got his first bicycle. Uh, He always wanted blue. He was obsessing about that. He wouldn't put on a helmet. Um, And it was... We just let him go, and of course he rode like a maniac because he thought it was a, a motorbike, uh, and of course fell off. Luckily, he didn't really hurt himself that badly, but yeah. it did lead to him wearing safety gear next time. And he actually, he actually wanted to put the safety gear on after that. Yes, he did. Yeah. <laughs> a, a bit like, and and you, you've captured that beautifully in the book. Um, where and I, I won't spoil the, the story for for any listeners who might want to read it for their children uh, or read it with their children, but you you capture it very beautifully as as um, he's quite you know fierce that he wants to go up this hill, no crash helmet because he wants to get to the top and he wants to go down again, yeah, and um, suffers a little crash at, at the bottom. But he's he's quite technical as well because he can put the bike back together. Well, he was he was a, a genius and he still is a genius with mechanical, uh, yeah machines of any yeah. sort really cars especially um but he was he would become obsessed with the idea this is what happens with some autistic children that you know, they do suffer from obsession so they that would preoccupy to the exclusion of any other thought and he was just determined to get to the top of the hill as fast as possible and come down even yeah. faster and this was a sort of a, a problem we had all along. So the other stories are based similarly on events that happened to us. Uh, the next book coming out is called The Dark Lake, which was we'd been to Lake Fernie in Wales and cycled around on his bike at the lake, and he saw the, the big Canadian canoes. Yeah, I wanted to have a go, and uh, he become he became obsessed for two days. So eventually, I relented, and we went out in this canoe, and um, it was an absolute disaster because he just couldn't handle it. But 
it's difficult as a parent again to make that relation between what's happening and whether it's just an immediate sort of bad temper or he's just getting annoyed with his parents. But underlying it, I know now, is this enormous anxiety which triggers all these other responses. And I suppose what I began to learn, but it took a long time. I'm a slow learner when it comes to being a parent. Mm. Um, Probably about 45 events I now know that putting him into a situation which sounds exciting, going out on a canoe, going into the lake, was actually probably not the right thing to do. But, but it's I, I very guess, difficult. Yeah, yeah. I, I, can, I can see how challenging it must be because you, mm-hmm. you've got you've got your son who desperately and obsessively wants to do something. Uh, but then on the other hand, if, if, um, if you let him do it or you do it with him, you've then got the anxiety kicking in as well. It must be very difficult. Yes, I think it is. It's... It's difficult to measure at the time because you have the obsessive determination of the child wanting to do whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Uh, and then your parental responsibility, which is to ensure that the child has a, a good life and enjoys things and and you want them to have the best. And then there's an undercurrent as you develop this relationship with your child that you think, well, maybe not. But mm. often you can't. It's very difficult to say no sometimes. So, know. so what 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 are the learnings from this? I mean, you mentioned that you know back in the sort of early nineties, we weren't as advanced as we are now in terms of our understanding of of this condition. What 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 would you do? Would you do it differently? Would, is there something you could do that would make it better in some way? Do you think? Well, if you lived your life again, you would do things differently, but it's not that easy, is it? <laughs> I think uh, there's far more information out there now for parents um, and also the, the some of the taboos about being autistic um, have gone. Yeah, I, th- I still suspect there are plenty left to be a worry uh, for parents. But um, when I was teaching, we'd often have lads who... I would think, well, this this boy is an undiagnosed ASD student, um, yeah. he has a few issues. And, of course, when Jay went to Cruckton Hall School, um, it had become a school for autism, a very good school for autism. Yeah. But prior to that, it was a, a school for wayward boys, and prior to that, it was a Borstal. So, and, and what school was that, Reef? Uh, Cruckton Hall School in just outside of Shrewsbury, uh, in, in Crupton. Um, it no longer exists, unfortunately. I think it got closed down due to funding. And so, yeah, it's a sad sad that it's gone, but it was a very good... It, it transformed his life and our lives, actually. Yeah. So, well, you're obviously very pleased with the way that your son's been... Um, how he's brought up now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, he's, he's a very hard-working lad. Yeah. Um, and pretty balanced i reckon yeah. so well, it sound, sounds like you gave him some great great support rafe um I, I, obviously he's aware of the book as well is he yes he likes it he likes it good <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, and the, the, it has a life of its own now so the the, the yeah. books are developing uh we have a another one coming out which is called the dark lake hopefully in the autumn and then there's a yeah. christmas one coming out and then another one in the spring oh excellent and these all have a a very loose advisory hint for the parents. I mean, yeah. really, they're just meant to be good fun for the kids yeah. to read. Well, I, I enjoyed it, and um, I'd have probably enjoyed it as a, ch- a child as well. Um, the illustrations are very, are very good. Uh, do you do you do the illustrations as well, Rafe? Yes, I, I start. Well, I've always been a, a drawer, so yeah. I, I drew the illustrations. I and uh, if you if you get the book, um, you'll see that the the giraffe is very blue. And there's very little colour because the idea here is that the focus is all on the giraffe's perception of what's going on, yeah. which is really what I began to realise was that the obsessive nature of autism means that the focus, a bit like tunnel vision. So when uh, the child sort of gets focused on something, everything peripheral to that can get lost. I mean, there were times when we thought we thought that... Uh, he was deaf because you know he'd be so obsessed with what's on the on the telly, uh, and that we would be saying things to him, and he would just completely 
disregard so we had his hearing tested it was all fine it was just to do with focus lock he so like with the bike he was absolutely obsessed about getting to the top of the hill and coming down as fast as possible mm. um, when we were out on the lake it was obsessed with going out to sea on this big ship yeah uh, kind of, and and you have a, another son as well Ray. yes i've got another son harry yeah uh he in, interestingly he's a plumber <laughs> Oh, is he? Ah. <laughs> yes. Uh, at the moment, he's just doing his gas fitting course uh, so he can become a qualified gas fitter. Yeah. Uh, and he's he's different from his brother, uh, but they both get on well. They got so on that's well. The that's, the that's the main thing. Yeah. So in, ter- in terms of the what, – what struck me when I was reading the book was that it looks to me as though there could be an opportunity at some point for it to be animated perhaps, small, you know, short films maybe. Have you thought about that? Uh, we've already done them. Uh, we've got anima- yes, I, I'm collaborating with my friend uh, Chris Parkhouse, who I used to be yeah. at college with at Kingston, and uh, we are creating animations. As, uh, we've also sketched uh, a theatre play around the character, yeah. and also uh, games. So we've got some proof of concept games which can be used on a mobile phone or an iPad or something similar. So yeah. the, the as I said, the project seems to have a life of its own. It's growing quite quite excitedly. Yeah, no, it's great. And so if people want to um, get hold of this book, it, it's just on Amazon, is it? Or can, can you get it from your website? Uh, at the moment, uh, there's a link on the website through to Amazon. Yeah. And it's amazon.co.uk or amazon.com. Uh, it's available as a downloadable kindle ebook yeah or you can actually buy the paperback and have it delivered to your house fantastic well we'll put that on the on the show notes so there's a direct link mm-hmm. to it and just for any listeners that are thinking of writing a book themselves possibly a children's book what 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 sort of process have you got and what advice would you give them rafe uh, my advice is just go for it actually uh i i probably made the mistake of reading too many things on the internet about how to do it yeah, and and that can actually befuddle your head somewhat with information, and and, and often it, it goes back to the way I work in the studio. Just have a go. I mean, it'll either work or it won't. But in the process of maybe not working the first time round, which it certainly didn't for me, um, you learn and then hone it and make it better. And it's the same with the drawings. It's the same with the publishing process. Um, I I was stumbled actually by how to get a book onto kindle and then i got put in touch with media and more and henry buxton and he has, has done a masterful job in turning my work into the physical objects that you can buy from amazon or download so and, and it's a, a a learning process I mean, as the more yeah. you have a go uh things open up and it seems to have a life of its own, and suddenly you're making connections, and it starts to fall into place. No, it, it, with all your, I mean, obviously in the introduction we saw all the different um, aspects of your life and the creative elements of your life. It's, it's fantastic. So, what other projects do you have coming up? What's next? Uh, I've got a some work going up to a gallery up in in North Wales. Where I create candlesticks and. Um, what I call wax illuminaires. Yeah. Uh, they're sort of like tabletop sculptures with candles so that you can use them. Every, most of my work has a sort of function of some sort. Uh, I've also designed and made some fountains. and um, But at the moment, the book is the priority because we have a series planned yeah. and it's getting that done and getting the drawings done and hopefully finding a publisher uh, other than just Amazon. You know, we want to broaden its appeal and get it into the shops because not everyone wants to go and buy online. They want to actually physically feel them in the shop. I think the book itself lends itself to um, somebody going into a shop and, and sort of feeling it and looking at it with all the visuals. Yeah, definitely. It's a touchy-feely thing, isn't it? It, it is. Yeah. I think it's very important. I mean, we've had... 18 months of being locked down and having to use the internet. And it's it's such a, 
a fantastic feeling being able to go out into a shop and touch things and yeah. feel them. You and it's something that we probably all took for granted prior to the COVID nineteen crisis. And uh, gosh, you know, I so enjoy going into a shop and looking at books in the flesh. So yeah, that's that's something I want to aim for getting them into the shops. Yeah, and you get the spontaneity. You perhaps see a book that you wouldn't have seen if you'd been looking for a particular genre on Amazon or whatever. Absolutely. I mean, searching is it's quite hard yeah. on Amazon. And- um, where can people find out more about your art, your sculptures and everything, Rafe? Well, I do have a website. It's uh, rafebaldwin.com, and that has pretty much everything that I've been doing, plus a link to Amazon where you can obtain the book. Yeah. We are working on a, a website specifically for the Blue Giraffe and that hopefully will go live soon. Excellent. Well, Rafe, thank you ever so much for coming on. It's been great talking to you after all these years. <laughs> and you, Bob. It's been a long time, but may it carry on. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> okay. Take care. Bye. You have been listening to Undercurrent Stories. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please feel free to share the show link to your friends and family. And if you have 60 seconds, I would be most grateful if you would please rate and review. To hear more episodes, please subscribe to the show and visit undercurrentstories.com. If you leave your email in the link, we will notify you as soon as new episodes are released. Also, check out our social media links, details of which can be found on the show notes. Until next time, this is Bob Wells wishing you all the very best.